in Hi, this is Miona at Absolute Radio, and I'm joined by the amazing, nothing but thieves, Connor and Dom. Hello. Hello, Hello how are you? We're very well, thank you. Good, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, you've just done some amazing show for 14 Green Day as well. What was that like? I mean, that was a different kind of gravy altogether. I mean, we've got to play some incredible venues, don't we? Yeah, it's been a while since we did an actual support run as well, a long while. So it was refreshing for us to have that challenge of trying to win people over and not knowing if music will go down well. But, um, Seemed to go down well, and people reacted to us, and we had a lot of fun. And like playing in those like nice little stadiums, it's just an experience that we don't know if we'll have ourselves. So it's great. Yeah, Wembley Stadium was definitely like a bucket list venue for us. So we were kind of pinching ourselves when we were on stage. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I saw you at Wembley Arena recently, where you were the you know, headline act, and it was absolutely fantastic. What was that like being? Well, London shows are just quite incredible for us because although we're an Essex band. It's sort of like the, where we went as kids to go and watch the big gigs. So it kind of feels like home from home and all of our family and friends come. And it's probably the most nerve wracking, but almost the most rewarding of, of the tours, the shows that we do, isn't it? Yeah, exactly that. And our, you know, it gives a nice stress to our tour manager. Yeah, <laughs> I think he ages uh, like 10 years <laughs> overnight with the London shows. Just the guests alone, I guess, stresses them out. And just going back to the beginning, how did you guys all meet? So you come from Essex, yeah. tell us the story. Um, it's a bit fitty. Dom and I, um, <clears throat> Dom came to my school to do music because his school didn't offer it for some reason. Um, and we started playing together and loved writing together, tolerated each other's company. Um, Rest in after all. Yeah, it think. does. Um, and then we decided to make some music properly. And Joe, I used to be in a band with Joe when I was a young, like, a lot younger. Um, Joe was a couple of years older than me at school. And he kind of took me under Still isn't. He's still a couple of years old than me. Funny how it works. Um, and, um, I just called him and was like, Do you want to try and take this seriously? I've, I've met this really fly guy. Um, and then it turns out you knew him anyway. Yeah, I did know Joe through, uh, through his lovely ex girlfriend. Um, I was about to say Ari, oh, RIP, she's still alive, thank God. Um, and uh, my cousin Phil is the bass player, so we kept in the family there. And uh, Pricey, the drummer, was just a, a mate who was in local band. So it's all very homegrown. Yeah. And yeah. this is we were like 15 or 16. Yeah. So we're now uh, we're now 30 odd years old. So it's been, been most of our life it's been a band. Mm. It's lovely that it's been so organic like that. And not manufactured yeah. in any way like some music is today. Yeah, yeah. I, I think actually I was, we were talking to uh, Billy Joe from Green Day. And he was saying one of the one of the, one of the reasons he thinks it was a good name drop. <laughs> um, one of the reasons he says that he thinks their band is still going strong is because they met and were friends first and the band came second and I do think there's mm-hmm. something to be said for mm-hmm. our band and, and how we get on and we still hang out and go for dinners and beers and, and holidays sometimes together so it's yeah friends first definitely helps yeah and obviously Connor um, from your voice when did you discover that you had this amazing voice oh, I don't know um, my dad is a singer I uh, grew up listening to him singing on the car I used to like go travel a lot around the country with him when I was, when I was a lot younger, just listen to him sing and he introduced me to a lot of old soul records and Aretha and Ray Charles and stuff like that and I think I just enjoyed that listening to him and then I guess I've had a go at it myself as, over the years and I think I got to secondary school and realised oh actually I just really enjoy it yeah. so I uh, yeah, took it a bit more seriously and I don't know still still I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist so I'm still like I push myself constantly to get better and better and better. I mean, your falsetto voice is just incredible. Um, it's, it's a standout feature of the band, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's pretty unusual. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so baffled. I can, I can talk about his voice. That's yeah, okay. Cheers, yeah. yeah, your falsetto is pretty good. Cheers, mate. The low stuff is also good, and the bits in between, fine for me. But um, <laughs> no, I, I think working with Connor, I've worked with other bands and stuff, and there's no one that sounds like Connor, and I think it reminds me of how blessed we are as a band to have a singer with such like a like diverse skill set and such a range and um, you're so versatile like Colin was just saying always trying to better himself so with every album we write trying to explore a new part of your voice so yeah that's the fun part of it it's like tri- like since we've, we've been writing for 11, 11 years I guess treating it like an instrument and how you find new sounds with an instrument it's I love messing around with it I love pushing myself I don't like being stuck in a box vocally and um, and just wanting to keep it fresh and enjoying it as much as you did when you were 15 and I don't think I'll ever stop enjoying it, so that's, that's great. 
Yeah, my son Dexter is really into your music, and he couldn't believe it was one vocalist. He thought it was several different people because well, of the range. I've got loads of different personalities. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, we actually do do that in the studio. We have different names sometimes for Connor's different right. voices, oh, okay. and uh, it can be quite helpful because um, it just gives you a different perspective on how to perform a song like. Uh, yeah. What, what's your high pitched voice called then? I guess it's like you ask me to get Mariah out. Yeah, Mariah. We, we will Mariah out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the low one? Low one? We don't really do enough low ones have a voice. There's normally just like do your Buckley voice, do Mariah. Yeah, Jeff Buckley's another one, yeah. Lemmy? Yeah, on Lemmy! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll give that one a go. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> try it on the next album. Yeah, if it tanks, we'll be blaming you. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, now, coming on to the album, Welcome to the DCC, what is DCC? Well, we've we've written this. Will, this is our fourth album now, and uh, I think as the walking, talking, rock cliche that we are, we thought we'd do a concept record. And it it was always a bit of a. I think we, as a band, we wanted to write songs with work in and outside of the concept, so you can listen to them, you hear it on the radio, still enjoy it, isolate it. But if you want to dive a bit deeper, there's a common thread through the Dead Club City, and it was this this idea that there's kind of a, a members club, but a city size scale members club basically and you know that the songs throughout are like do you want to be a part of it do you do you, don't you if you're in it do you want to be in it and yeah. it's, it, it's it's again we want to leave a little bit of a mystery to it and i think there's been quite fan, fun to see some of the fan perspectives on it and their takes some of them have been incredibly incredibly wrong but very entertaining <laughs> yeah. yeah like tom says it's really important for us to keep things fresh and experiment and try Try new avenues of writing, and we were a bit not that we were stuck after Mariah Panic, but we during the pandemic, and you know, nothing was changing literally, nothing was changing. We wrote Moral Panic 2, and it felt like we were just extending Moral Panic because the world was just extending, you know. Um, so for us to have this new lease of life and shape our songwriting through a different kind of tunnel was really, really fun. Um, I'm not sure how we, we how, what we do the next time, you know, if we do some another avenue, but it was, um. It was really good. It was a good experiment for us as songwriters as a challenge to kind of do that. Write, still write soulful, meaningful songs that mean a lot to you, but put them in an interesting package in a sense and have an avenue to write through. I, I really enjoyed that. We all did. Yeah. And Dom, you produced it as well, didn't you? Cool. Oh, that's good. Yes. So what's that like producing your own work? Can I talk about you now? Yeah. Let's talk it around. Can you genuinely that was my line. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot to take, you know, to take off. Like you're you're dealing with your four band members who are your brothers, but also your, your business partners essentially. And you're you're not just a part of the writing, but you're you're the head of the rap team. You're taking that and, and we're there for five months. And I just wanted to say it for weeks and weeks, like like we just so gracefully gracefully handled everyone and was such a friend first before producer first. And that's so hard to do when you're in the band that you both trying to produce. So yeah, I just want to say that before you have to talk about it. No, work. Point, but yeah, yeah just uh, you know it doesn't really it doesn't really take the credit for that very much. But yeah, it was brilliant. It was a pleasure to work with. Wow. <laughs> That's what I wrote down sure. before and it was almost the basic. <laughs> yeah, I've been practicing yeah. yeah. Um no I think for this record, because we'd spent so long on the demos, the boys had confidence in me kind of taking it to the finish line. And so did I and I think if I didn't feel or well, the boys didn't feel equally that I could do that, then we would go elsewhere. But it just felt right for this record. Um, and someone did say, like a few people have said actually, like who's who's better to realise the vision of your band than somebody in the band, I guess. And sometimes, I think any earlier, we would, would maybe have not been able to do it, but you know, we've learned a lot through other producers. So yeah, very, very uh, lucky to do that with the boys, and they were all amazing with me. So well. much fun as well. We had um, about five months in Essex, we just basically, ripped out this house, this little estate, and uh, put our studio in, just spent five months there, enjoying ourselves, and taking time to kind of go back over things, which which was, we never normally got, if we were in America for a month, we're trying to cram, and the songs it, yeah. it so hard, so that was, that was good, obviously you get to the end and you are rushing still, <laughs> but it was such a cool experience, that was. And one of the songs from the album that we've been playing on Absolute Radio, and that you play in session today, is Overcome. Could you tell us a little bit about that song? Well, that was how early was that? Was one of your early ones? Yeah, I think it was one of, one of the first ones that we wrote for Dead Club City. And actually, I think you came in with like a little idea and 
the three of us, myself, Joe and Connor, sat together and kind of pulled it apart, put it back together again. And um, it was giving us this kind of like uh, Americana driving down the, the freeway, like nothing else matters to, to you kind of vibe. Um, and it was quite feel good for us. We normally quite like quite, quite, quite that was bleak songs. Wasn't it? it was basically just a little pop ditty that was quite mangery. And I don't think at first it, was, it didn't, didn't really feel right, but Bond's ears are so good with it. Um, where we could turn it into, you know, a kind of anthem thing that has a melancholy to it, but also some hope towards the end, um, which is which is really good. I think we got the sound right. Yeah, it's, it's, trial it's definitely one of our more uplifting songs without, without going too deep into the lyrics. And obviously, we show overcome as we've done before. And I think it's been the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives over the last like year or so. And it's been so nice to hear it connect with fans and at festivals in particular. It's yeah. a real, oh my God, it's a festival. real moment. And really when the sun's going down and someone's spilling half a cider over their mate, <laughs> it's just magic. Yeah, it is. It's a beautiful song. And Amsterdam, when did you know that that was going to be the big one? You know, the big finale song. Did you know from the beginning or has it just evolved that way? I think it's our first royalty check. It's pretty reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. It was rubbish. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, live was the moment really yeah. kind of connected, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, we. That was the first. So that's the second album. Just to go back. Yeah, that was the second album. We. Um, that was the first time when we finished an album, we went to play the first gig, and that was the first single. Because the Dingwall was actually yeah. not too far from here. And we um, really saw all the crowd were already singing the song, and we were like, what? what's going on? This is amazing. It's been out for a couple of days. <laughs> We've never experienced that before, really. Like with the first album and the EPs, you know, people grew to know the songs, but that song had been out for a few days, like half a week, and they were singing along, and we were like, looking at each other, what's going on? I think I even said it on stage, but. How do you know the words better than I do, isn't it? But um, yeah, that was a real moment, that first that first live gig. And I think when we were in the studio, we really believed in it. We wanted to, it was the first song we recorded. And I think it was the first uh, week of energy we had in like quite a, you know, a tough month of recording, trying to cram songs in. And we just put everything into that first recording and just yeah, really went for it. It was awesome. And what is next for you? Because that was your fourth album. Is it too soon to talk about a fifth? I mean, when would you come on to that? Well, I think we're going to finish up touring this record, and it's been pretty relentless, but we've loved like every second of it. We go off to Asia and then back to North America later this year. But um, once we're finished with that, I think we're going to take some time to sleep and rest and be with our loved ones, and then uh, attempt to write a new record perhaps next year. But yeah, we just want to make sure it's right and make sure that it's the best thing that we put out. So hard to put a time stamp on it, but next year will be the start of that, that process for sure. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us on Radio. Thank you, Alan. Cheers. And we'll cut there. Thank you very much, guys. That's a wrap, which I hate oh, saying. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you. You're very good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.